So we're here at the Linaro Connect, and uh, who are you? I'm uh, Ed Vilmedi from Packet. I run the Works on ARM project for Packet. So uh, you just had a presentation, and you were talking about the latest uh, stuff that's going on. So there's a lot of different platforms that you have. Yeah, so um, most of the system that we uh, run uh, for ARM is uh, Cadmium Thunder X based, uh, and we have, an, in addition, some high silicon high 1616 based hardware, the DO5 platform that Huawei built. Um, and in addition, we're in the midst of uh, adding to that um, some Thunder X2 systems, as well as a couple different uh, platforms from Socionext, their Syncwacer, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and also uh, the latest is the Ampere uh, uh, equipment that just got announced today. So, um, so the Thunder X2, for example, you get them as soon as they became available, kind of, or they like they took a while to become available, or we got them pretty early. Um, the uh, the challenge with new hardware is that you have to shake out the firmware. Um, so we got some systems. We uh, just upgraded to the latest firmware that they have and are now in the midst of getting them into the hands of some of the some of the projects that we work with that really need that hardware because it's special. Um, it's the only system on the market that does uh, large systems extensions. So we have, I spoke with uh, someone today who was very interested in testing out some compilers that were enabled for that. Uh, so does uh, it, a lot of people waiting for this uh, Thunder X2, right? It's, it's supposed to be a super powerful... It's a very interesting machine. Um, it has... It can be configured with... Uh, let's see, so... Two 28-core CPUs with four hardware threads per core, so a total of on the order of 215 or 216 or 200... 24 um, threads and most people writing software for ARM don't think in terms of systems like that right their their worldview is four core machines eight core machines 16 core machines so it's it's very interesting for software developers to tr to work to figure out how to take the best advantage of that sort of system so um, so it's called packet Net. And it's not a very, very old company, right? But it's very uh, active and very a lot of things happening. Yeah, so we've been in business for about four years now. Uh, Packet just announced a, a $25 million uh, Series B round, which I should know who the lead investor is, but I don't off the top of my head. Um, but it's it's been... Um, I've been at the Works on ARM project for a little more than a year now, and it started out really with um, an understanding that we knew that people needed to get access to hardware, but we didn't quite, weren't quite sure who it was going to be. Um, and it has been a bunch of work to understand the ecosystem, make friends with people at distributions, get referrals into language development and cloud native computing efforts. and telco workloads and various things to just try to really understand the infrastructure so that we can help it the best. So are you the world leader, is Packet the world leader in an ARM server kind of making it available? Uh, we're clearly the world leader in bare metal ARM servers in terms of access to the public. Um, the Packet is small compared to an Amazon or compared to a Google or a, a these huge Microsoft, server, right. These huge but we, these server companies in, uh, in somewhere in Texas. Yeah. They have giant things. Just enormous, right? So we're yeah. not at that scale, um, but we're innovative and pretty quick moving and have had a lot of luck working with people who, for whatever reason, their problem lends itself to working inside a physical bare metal machine rather than trying to solve their problem inside a virtual machine. So, um, Packet is kind of a new leader in this kind of bare metal, or not really leader? I would say we're a leader. Um, so there's only, I guess it, I, I saw someone who did a market analysis of like, 
where can you get bare metal? How much it costs per hour? How many, <coughs> how, how many data centers are people in whatnot? And uh, we're definitely one of the larger companies in what's a relatively small market. Um, I would say that the need, f the appreciation of what you can do with um, really understanding what the hardware does and taking the most, instead of dealing with a virtualized view of the world, understand what the hardware can do and write to that hardware um, can be really powerful for some people. Um, we've had experience with people moving workloads from virtual to bare metal and they, you know, get better performance and it costs less um, without, without too much extra work. So that's, that's been a, a positive experience. So, but then when we talk uh, x86 and, and ARM, so it's a, a successful company, that's why there's a Series B is happening and all that stuff. Right. So it's growing. It's growing. There's a lot of funds to expand uh, where there's demand. We're um, in the midst of opening up a new uh, data center in Texas, um, in Dallas, um, and expanding out the size of the team. So it's it's been a good, you know, it's it's heading in the right direction. And uh, the, what's what's been the experience with the ARM stuff so far? It, it, you, you were mentioning that there's a lot of people that do interesting things you didn't, maybe didn't expect. So the experience with ARM has been, um, if I compare where we are now to where we were a year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, um, the distributions were in good shape and a lot of the user contributed software was was not in as good shape. And what we've seen is a series of um, investments by various folks to make sure that not only does the software that they're trying to use, that it's portable enough that it works on ARM, but also that people have been optimizing their code so that it runs fast on ARM. And what I've been looking for in the Works on ARM project is a diversity of enough different projects going on Right, some of the most important things and also some more, um, I don't know, esoteric, obscure, not very well-known projects to make sure that we get a b really broad coverage of the whole ecosystem. And you mentioned that you have some things that are paid at market price and some things are free. What is free? So the, the Works on Arm project is sponsored by Arm to give access to open source projects to get infrastructure for uh, test and development and primarily for CI CD. So the people who are getting that free level of access are doing things like producing the latest version of Java or the latest version of Go or that are doing operating system development or some key application development. Um, or they're running CI systems aimed at free service for folks. But fairly quickly, people, especially who are running CI, realize that there's a commercial market as well because they can do a system that will do um, builds for embedded systems and other sorts of 32-bit chips um, much like six to eight times faster native compared to doing it emulated. So there's a, there's a lot of value in that, and they're willing to they're willing to pay for that service. So you say, for example, there's some companies that uh, that build uh, build a, what's called the image for IoT devices. Right. So there's a company called Resin, which has been doing that. Um, they're using Packet as part of their infrastructure, and using Resin to manage essentially you're managing containers on a embedded Linux system through the Resin infrastructure. The so, whole build, test, deploy, manage, maintain cycle. So I've been doing ARM server videos for eight years now. Yes. Uh, so is it uh, just about to explode? What do you think? Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge that we have at Packet is availability of hardware. There's a lot of stuff that's been announced that's very hard to buy. Um, and we still run into genuine issues sometimes of taking servers from vendors and in integrating them into our infrastructure. Um, I've long since given up on predicting when markets are going to explode. 
Um, I know that there's steady demand. There's more demand for the service that I provide for people doing build and development work um, every every month. There's people coming, people who I don't know, coming to me and saying, "Hey, we've got code. We want it to work on ARM. We understand that you have some infrastructure. We'd like to support ARM in our product." Um, that's all. That's all in a really good direction now. Are, are they supporting that for um, embedded systems? Are they supporting it for single board computers? Are they supporting it for servers? Are they supporting it just because they think it would be good to have a portable product? Um, hard to say. So, uh, so you not you, you don't want to say on camera if you think that next year ARM will be or by twenty twenty it's, it's going to be twenty five percent of all new servers. Because um, that was two or three years ago. That's what Arn said they would Yeah, do. so um, I think it is up to a bunch of server vendors to really execute on that demand. Um, we know that there is good uptake in the HPC market for ARM-based systems for a variety of reasons. Um, we know that ARM has a very strong position in embedded. Um, it's, but cracking the server market is a really, I don't want to minimize how hard that problem is. So I'm not going to guess. I, I'm very hopeful, right? I would really love to see a 25% market. That would be great. Because it's, it's, it's great, not just because you've been doing all that stuff that has ARM related in the name, right? But it'd be great because it's, it's exciting for the, the whole industry. It's exciting for the competition happening and something different, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, always exciting when people bring competitive products to market that are that address the well understood needs but that are different enough that people can, you know, have to make a decision about stuff. Um, I think it's good for I think it's good for the ARM world to have strong servers in that world even if the demand for them doesn't hit 25% of the market, it's still good for the ecosystem that people can develop for ARM on ARM, um, right? That they can not have to cross-host their platforms for, for development work. And uh, you have some Qualcomm servers and you have some, uh, uh, but not everybody can just access it yet or something. It sounds like because uh, it's been nearly a year that uh, I kind of heard them say, ah, oh, yeah, it's available. Uh, the Thunder X2 and the Qualcomm, but it's right. not really it takes, completely available. It takes what? well, it takes time from the time that someone announces working first silicon to the time that you can go into mass production. That if you decide to go into mass production, it takes time. You have to, you know, early silicon is often different from final silicon. There's changes that get made as people find issues. Um, there can be, in a lot of these systems that have a lot of cores, you have a lot of choices about what exact part to make. Do you make the, you know, 48 core part? Do you make the 46 core part? Do you make the 44 core part? How much do these things cost? How, what are your yields on all the, pro, on the on these things? So there's, from the time of announcement to the time of real quantity general availability, there's a lot to be figured out. Um, and then some of the sales cycles are just longer, right? People are not selling these one at a time, um, for the most part. I mean, sometimes you can get, you can order one, but a lot of the server chip makers are really targeting the hyperscalers of this world where you're looking at, you know, data center size purchasing rather than one at a time purchasing. So part of the, the work that you do is also um, <coughs> kind of prom uh, promotion or what do you call it? Uh, there, there's You have the Twitter? Yeah, so um, part of it is just keeping track of the whole ecosystem. Um, I produce a newsletter almost every week that has news about, uh, has sometimes has videos from you, it sometimes has press releases from, from folks, um, software announcements, um, just general news about the ecosystem. And then I maintain a Twitter account that will repost or comment on various things going on in the and industry. And they're both called Works on Arm? Arm? They're both called Works on Arm. Works on Arm. And so what's kind of like the, some of the latest couple of months of cool news? There, 
I, I heard that a couple of days ago Ampere announced something. Yeah, Ampere announced um, that they uh, have a new 32-core ARM chip running at more than three gigahertz, which will be which is the fastest clock speed that anyone has announced so far. I haven't seen that hardware up close to know exactly how it behaves. I don't know. Custom design. Custom design cores. So is, um, is it this is the X Gene three? It is the X Gene three, yeah. Yeah, or something related to yeah. the X Gene three. So it's the X Gene. They're calling it Emag now, for okay. whatever reason. People pick names. It sounds like something like uh, because an American company. Uh, as a little bit of a joke, but yeah, there's. I think Mag is something to do with guns, right? Uh, you know, it has. Uh, you know, it could be magnetic, uh, it could ah, yeah, be any, any of a number of things, right? Very common. So I, I guess the, the, the biggest news is usually small news, because I, I have 600 words to write every week or 1,000 words to write every week, so try to keep people abreast for smaller things. The, the biggest software improvement that I see of late is a recent release of Go, the Go language. Um, which has a bunch of ARM-specific uh, optimizations in it um, that will make some code 20, 30, 40 percent faster, just because they're using assembly instead of instead of Go to do critical path for some algorithms. So who's the who's the biggest users of Go? Is it the um, Google? Google is a big user of Go, and then there's a whole mess of what gets called cloud-native software. So Docker, Kubernetes, a bunch of Kubernetes tooling is written in Go. Um, it's a very, um, it's a very modern systems language. It it knows how to deal with systems that have more than one CPU fairly well, whereas some older languages struggle to do parallelism across a bunch of across a bunch of threads. So it's in it's a. It's not the only language that you want to write code in, but for some fairly substantial set of problems that are characteristic of modern computing, it's a good it's a good choice. So that's important news because uh, so is is a lot of Google infrastructure in Go, or did they say? Yeah, a lot of Google infrastructure in Go and Kubernetes, which is a, derived from a Google project, um, is all written in Go. So so that could potentially be like a kind of what you call it a, a clue as to maybe they're on the verge of announcing huge ARM data centers. You know, again, I'm not going to guess what they're, what they're doing. Uh, what I would say is that um, it's been great to work with the developer community. Um, we get contributions from ARM directly, from Linaro, uh, from a number of independent developers, from um, various licensees like Qualcomm and and Cavium and and uh, and others, um, and just to see how people can uh, cooperate to get things done has been really helpful.